Hello, hello, and welcome to PD in your PJs. I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about making feedback your focus with Seesaw. I'm here with Arthur, and he'll be talking in just a few minutes. But before we get to the good stuff, I want to tell you that you should hear me talking now. We are recording our session right now, and you will receive the recording in an email shortly after we conclude. The best part, though, is that we will share the slides, so you'll get to look through those at your own convenience later and click on some of the resources and take a closer look. So those will be coming your way shortly in just about two hours. Quick introduction. I'm Julie. I was a high school ELA teacher, and as Arthur is as well, so we have a lot of things in common. I'm now on the teacher community team at Seesaw. If you can, go ahead and give me a follow on Twitter. I'm at EdTechJulieJ. I share lots of ideas and resources about Seesaw. And then, of course, you can connect with our whole team on Twitter at Seesaw. Now, I do want to tell you that what Arthur's talking about tonight is not how to create a class or how to get started with Seesaw. So if you're in need of that sort of information, please find it at ideas.seesaw.me. And as always, you can check out the upcoming webinar schedule at web.seesaw.me backslash PDs. I just have one quick favor I wanna ask you before I turn it over to Arthur. At the end of our um, session tonight, you're gonna to see a survey pop up on your screen. I would love to have some of your feedback. We really value it and we use it to make our PD sessions better. So just take a minute to answer the questions. It only takes about a minute. And then as a bonus, we do draw one t-shirt winner at random every week from those responses. So complete the survey for your chance to win. Okay, Arthur, I am about to change it over to you. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks, Julie. Glad to be here. Well, thank you. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. All right. Okay, I'm kind of playing around with this. Welcome, everyone. I can't hear you apparently, but I'm going to just keep talking. And then every now and again, I will ask Julie if there are any questions. Um, can everyone see um, my screen at this point? I can't see it yet. I have a, a okay. message on my screen that says waiting okay. to view. Okay, hold on. Are we, how about there? Not quite. Let me see if it's coming. Okay. If not, I can definitely. Oh, here it is. We got it. You're good. Okay, it looks like it's kind of loading up a little bit. Okay. All right. Everyone see that? Yes, you are good. I'm going to mute myself, Arthur, and then just let me know if you want to take a question or I will let you know if we have anything um, pressing to say. Okay. Uh, my name is Arthur Caravelli. I am a co-founder of Teachers Going Gradeless. You can follow me at HHS Caravelli. That's my high school, has a high school. Uh, we have a website at teachersgoinggradeless.com. And uh, we have Twitter chats actually on Sunday, nine to 10. Every other week, we're getting a Spanish chat actually that's gonna alternate uh, starting this weekend. You can also find us Teachers Going Gradeless on Facebook. So I'd love to have you follow us in those couple places um, so that you can kind of follow up on some of the stuff here. We're gonna go really fast. I'm not used to doing this. So 30 minutes is gonna kind of go really fast, but I will occasionally pause and give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, I think a really good idea to do right now, and I'm gonna pause here for a moment, if you would, just open up another tab and get this URL. If you could take a second right now so that you can follow along. Uh, there are a lot of resources that I'm gonna open up. You're welcome, I'll, I'll go there Personally, you'll see them on my screen, but if you would take a second just to open up the session page right there. Okay, I don't know if you're done, but I'm gonna go ahead. Anyways, I wanna get us started. Before I introduce myself a little bit more, um, I want you to think about this. What comes to mind when you think about grades? And if you're feeling especially tech savvy right now, if you would go to a poll everywhere, right now, kind of as I introduce myself, again, I'm having you put a lot of things in and I hope you're getting there in time and I'm not annoying you by going too fast. But um, I'm gonna take a look at this here in a second. Oops, get out of the way. Please get out of the way there. Um, if you could text 37607 to Arthur Chiara 
at 135. And I'm just curious to hear from you, get a little bit of feedback as to what comes to mind when you think of grades. Maybe you're dealing with grades right now. I know parent-teacher conferences are going on right now for a lot of us. Um, it's going on for me this week. And I'm just curious, what comes to mind when you think of grades? Can be just a word, can be a sentence, can be a phrase. Okay, I am going to move on here. Okay, a little bit about me. I have a very large family. This is my family. I have eight children. This is up in the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and we always go to Jim and Yanni's. So if I have any Michiganders out there, hello to you. Um, we always try to get our one family photo, basically. And as you can see, it's kind of choose your own adventure here uh, with our children. But um, they range from age age to uh, someone who's turning 16, Grace all the way down to Zalia. I'm not even going to name all the rest of them because it would take too long. Uh, but anyways, it is, um, you know, they are they are my life. And, and um, part of the reason why I've gone gradeless actually is in part because of just how time consuming, ridiculously time consuming, everything associated with grades is. And uh, that is one of the reasons why I have gone gradeless. So I'm going to jump over right now. Um, hopefully, let's see if I can do it. Go over to this. Did any? Did it work? Did anyone actually do any? No responses yet. Okay, so um, I guess that didn't work, Julie. Um, are you getting any questions on your end? I actually am not, but listeners, feel free to type a question in the question box. Arthur's going to stop here and there, and he can take a few. So if you have them um, at any point in our session, feel free to type them in. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead. Um, yeah, that's so I wanted to start out. First of all, I, I have I am co-founder of this group, Teachers Going Gradeless. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that, actually, because um, Seesaw has allowed me to do some of the things that I do and um, has allowed me to go gradeless in a certain way uh, such that people kind of know what's going on um, in a richer way than you would have in a traditional grade book like you see here. Um, so I want to give you, first of all, a definition of gradeless. First of all, it could just be grading less, uh, limiting the impact of grades within the context of current constraints. So that, that would just be kind of toxic grading practices like one-shot assessments, um, zeros on the 100, mathematically disproportionate 100-point scale, um, zeros for plagiarism, zeros for other behavioral things that are just going into that academic grade, uh, blurring that academic grade, and really being quite punitive to students. The other thing is without grades, and that's avoiding the damaging and demotivating effects of grades entirely. And there is a spectrum between these two things, whether you be grading, you're grading less and finding ways to kind of not focus on grades, put the focus on learning. And, and then actually many of our teachers really don't grade at all throughout the term. And then have conferences, many of us do need to enter grade, ultimately have a conference later on in that term uh, where the, the students will kind of compile some evidence and we'll have a conversation about that. Uh, another key to this is it's going, you know, so you don't need to jump right into the deep end. I, I think a lot of us started by grading less and limiting the impact of grades within the current constraints. Okay, so a couple ideas here. Dylan William, one of the main people kind of helped us to think about this, which is this quote from, is the feedback you're giving students helping or hindering? When teachers pair grades with comments, common sense would tell us that this is a richer form of feedback. But our work in schools has shown us that most students focus entirely entirely on the grade, the letter grade or the score, and fail to read or process teacher comments. Anyone who has been a teacher knows how many hours of work it takes to provide meaningful comments, that most students virtually ignore that painstaking correction advice and praise is one of public education's best kept secrets. Joe Bowler, uh, I, I was all. I also teach math, or I have taught math, and she is kind of in the math realm. We now know that grades and test scores demotivate 
and there's lots of research about this, rather than motivate students, they communicate fixed and damaging messages to students that result in lower achievement in classroom. So any of us who are interested in uh, engendering a growth mindset in our students, uh, grades work against that, scores work against that. Okay, so what's the point of portfolios? Portfolios can play a role in this. And uh, here's a nice quote. The portfolio is a robust substitute for the rigid strictures of the traditional grade book, a flexible structure for teachers who desire to de-emphasize grades in favor of feedback, revision, and growth. And uh, I said that. So why go gradeless? Um, Actually, I'm sorry, I apparently have some duplicate slides here. I'm going to jump down here to Seesaw. Um, so the question is, what role can Seesaw play in all of that? And I have a few things that I'm going to go over as quickly as I can. I'm going to stop every now and again and give you a chance to kind of chime in and have a question if you need one. Uh, first of all, is kind of setting up your class. As Julie mentioned, I'm not going to show you how to get all of Seesaw set up, but I am going to talk about a couple things that will help you in terms of going gradeless. Self-assessing work. This is uh, critical, encouraging self-assessment with your student. That is one of the more powerful things that you can do when you, when you move away from grades. Providing feedback. Uh, Seesaw really puts you in a very good position to do that as well. And then finally, conferencing for a grade when you have that portfolio that you can come back to you really can put together your best evidence and you can kind of have a nice conference there. So first of all, setting up your class, if you build it, they will come. Um, and I have a quote here from Larry Ainsworth where I want one of the things to think about when you're doing this is really prioritizing standards. Uh, you shouldn't have the whole common core uh, in your Seesaw, and, and I am kind of a standards-based person, but I have definitely prioritized standards. So prioritizing the standards has nothing to do with lowering the bar and everything to do with focus. It is about less being more. The difference is in the degree of focus given to certain standards over others. So what I do is um, one of the things you can do in Seesaw is you can set up folders and I, I have actually there's you can attach standards and Julie probably wants us to go with that premium version where you can attach standards but actually you can use folders to have students kind of put their artifacts into the appropriate standard and you can see some of the ones that I use uh, these are in my English 12 class I kind of get them a nice uh, rainbow order alphabetic order uh, I'll go over here to my seesaw and kind of show you what that looks like if it loads. Um, okay, I'll just click on this and you can see I'm actually in AP now. And I set up folders um, and, and students, whenever they put things in their seesaw, whenever they add something to their seesaw, they are prompted to file it in its appropriate folder okay so this is something that you can set up within seesaw um, let me see if i can show you that would be over here with our little uh, manage folders and you can create folders here um, and you can see i have many items in in these folders but these are folders that students can reference, especially when they're going through that self-assessment process. Okay, so I think that that's a nice little process you can set up. Um, let me get out of here and actually you can show add to folder step is an important setting to have. Both students and teachers should be able to do that. Okay, Julie, are there any questions? I actually, I actually don't have any, Arthur, but I love what okay. you're saying about folders. Um, your demonstration is really good. It's reminding people how to do that in their settings in Seesaw, so that's really helpful. Um, listeners, don't forget, you can type in a question in the question box, and Arthur will answer it for you before we wrap up tonight. Yes, indeed. 
Okay. Uh, one other thing that I kind of help students do now, we're, we're kind of ramping up for the exam, so please don't hate on me for the fact that we're doing a lot of the same things. Um, we are really kind of doing a lot of, this is how to read a poem, how to read a prose prompt. Uh, we're doing a lot of the same thing. I kind of keep people on track a little bit by pushing this out to them um, and letting them know what kind of artifact it is because they have a choice as to, you know, how they're going to enter this in. Uh, many of them are taking photos and I really like that. I'm going to show you something I do with that a little bit later on. Have a due date, uh, any learning standard or standards. Uh, many times, many, many, many times I have them include the hard copy, actually turn that into me. But I like to have that one artifact, maybe that best page uh, that they really want to talk about when they self-assess. Okay, moving on to encouraging self-assessment, know thyself. This is, I think, one of the more powerful things that you can do with Seesaw. And we have this quote from Susan Brookhart. Student self-assessment satisfies both motivational and achievement needs. Students who can size up their work, figure out how to close, how close they are to the goal, and plan what they need to do to improve are, in fact, learning as they do that. And continuing on here, carrying out their plans for improvement not only makes their work better, but helps them feel in control, and that is motivating. This process called self-regulation has been found to be a characteristic of successful, motivated learners. And uh, here's another quote. Why don't students develop those traits of self-assessment? It's because our total monopoly on assessment, feedback, and grading has trained them to adopt an attitude of total passivity in the learning process. That was me again. Okay, so one of the cool things you can do with Seesaw is you, you can have them kind of take notes of, uh, make note of cool things that they're doing. And uh, they can do that through their comments, obviously. Um, and many things I have them just self-assess and kind of talk about how they are making progress in response to feedback here. I'm trying to get them to notice things uh, that are going to be helpful to them on the AP exam as they read. And so this student actually bought the book and, and is writing directly in the book and is sharing some of that with me so that I can have targeted feedback with her. Uh, similarly, we have this guy kind of thinking about um, some progress that he's made um, doing the open prompt is one of the prompts that you have to do on the AP English Literature exam. Actually, one more thing about this is you can see that I've done audio feedback here down at the bottom, and that is my favorite type of feedback that you can do through Seesaw. I am not a huge fan of rubrics. And I like to give that individualized feedback. I, I definitely let people know, you know, some of the standards that we're striving for. I like that to be something of a dialogue. I, I definitely know a little bit what quality looks like. But rubrics, I feel, actually have not helped me that much to encourage students to really develop as writers. And this is Linda Mabry who talks about this phenomenon, which is really just all over the place at this point, uh, especially with the assessment of writing through tests. And she says, the standardization of a skill that is fundamentally self-expressive and individual its assessment standardize the teaching of writing, which jeopardizes the learning and understanding of writing. And so instead of that, I'm just going to give you one other thing that I kind of do here. Actually, I want to say a couple more things. Uh, what else? Uh, equity, some questions of equity. When you have a rubric, well, you know, not every kid is necessarily going to see themselves in that rubric, not necessarily going to see an opportunity for self-expression in that rubric. And uh, David E. Kirkland was uh, at, right here in, at Michigan State University, has since moved on to northern our New York University, he says, we tell young urban kids that their identities don't matter. We tell them that the way they see the world doesn't matter. The way they construct selves within the world doesn't matter. But not only do we negate those identities, we criminalize them, we vilify the, those identities. And he says, so it's much more than ignoring, it's more than discounting. And I, I underline that because of the counting aspect of that, the, the grades and the scores. 
really related to that. When I follow those same young people, the burgeoning identities outside the classroom, they're reading and writing in complicated and beautiful ways, yet in ways that we fail to recognize and value. And in part, I believe that's because we come to the table with a lot of preconceived notions about what mastery, what, what really demonstrating those skills would look like. And I think one of the cool things that we've had a chance to do is uh, um, students were able to demonstrate skills of oral literature, characteristics of oral literature, ancient literature uh, involves alliteration, parallelism, and repetition. And uh, we had an amazing rap that actually featured a lot of people who uh, for whom English is not their first language. And uh, many of these raps actually were in that first language. And uh, because I can hear repetition and parallelism and alliteration whenever I hear it, um, I, I'm able to assess that. But I feel like in part that's because I've moved away from grades, because I've moved away from rubrics and I don't need this objectivity that we have sort of a consensus around. We can kind of open it up and value those funds of knowledge that students bring. Okay, another thing that I do is I do keep an exemplary, uh, kind of a warehouse of exemplary student work. Um, I'm just kind of continually adding to these folders right here. Um, and I will occasionally post this shortened URL just to say, look at this exemplary student work. Um, let's, let's see if we can imitate this. But not only that, um, I, I am continually adding to it. So if we get a better understanding of something, I'm open to that. It's more of a two-way street. And uh, I'll give you a chance to kind of look at that yourself because we're kind of already bumping up against the clock here. Uh, but anyways, I just copy the the pictures that students have uploaded into Seesaw. It's great. I don't even need to snap pictures of exemplary student work. Students are posting it themselves. And I'm continually sending them to this folder, uh, depending on the standard that we're working on, to get some ideas about what that exemplary student work looks like. OK, providing feedback, going to move through this. Don't be a martyr because feedback can get pretty intense. As Carol Jago says, you're reading as fast as you can, but the pile of unread essays grows taller and taller, guilt mounts. Students want to know when their papers will come back. Grading begins consuming all your energy, your weekends, your life. And I think many of us, especially English language arts teachers, know what I'm talking about. I've also been a math teacher and it can get pretty hectic there as well. And uh, you know, here are my children and Here's one that I hadn't seen up to the last moment there, but um, you know this is a very common scene for me, and and part of this is uh, having a better balance. Um, you know what I found out. I think the thing that allowed me to make a change was when I realized that this sort of backbreaking level of feedback was not good for me, but it was also not good for my students because again, it was that monopoly on assessment. Uh, and really giving students a chance to do that. But when I do provide feedback, I love providing verbal feedback with Seesaw. I can talk faster than I can write. And I'll show you where you can do that. I, I do screencasts with Screencastify. I have a letter to class method that I developed um, based on Dr. Todd Finley's idea. And again, I post exemplary student work for students to look at uh, in Seesaw. I'll regularly kind of just post something that I thought was pretty good. And I, I kind of give a student a chance to really shine um, with that work. And other students can kind of see whether or not their work is measuring up. Uh, as you can see, I am doing some verbal feedback. Oh, man, this thing keeps getting in the way. I'm going to not move. Uh, but the cool thing that you can do with your comment is you can either type a comment, you can do a text comment, but more often than not, I actually record a comment and you only get two minutes. And thank you, Seesaw, for only giving me two minutes because if I had more than that, I would probably go much longer. But I think what it's taught me is to make that feedback count. Um, make it about two things. Make it about three things. Give them one thing that they can work on. Um, I think it's also had me do more targeted writing assessments instead of big, huge writing assessments. And if I do 
a big, huge writing assessment. I'm focusing in on small things so that I can actually give them that targeted feedback. Not going to have a chance to really show you this, but Screencastify does a really good job of this. Um, it produces you. I basically it will record your screen as you are talking about a student paper. And I have linked to this video, but you can see I'm down here in the corner. Um, I'm looking at the student's paper and I'm scrolling through it and I'm giving them this very high quality feedback as they listen. No. Okay. Um, I, it looks like I might have lost a slide there, but here's one other thing that I do is I'll post exemplary student work. If I see some exemplary student work, by the way, I didn't snap this photograph. It was a student photograph and I just took it and I cut off the name and I posted it because it was awesome and I wanted students to kind of see what had been done here and you can see many parents are taking a look at this as well and I feel like we are building our understanding of what the AP exam wants. And this is the main thing to take away and actually it looks like I'm going to probably have to stop at this before we have time to talk about conferencing which is a very cool topic in and of itself. This is Dylan William again. The main thing with feedback is that the students do something with it. Okay, and you can see students are listening to my feedback and what do they do with it? I simply have them write it at the top of their next attempt. And so they have a couple things that they're gonna work on because I have not given them a whole ton of things to do and they are going to make steady improvement throughout the year just hearing that feedback and not getting any grades but just getting that feedback that they pay attention to because they're not distracted by the grade i'm going to jump down to the end we this we're not going to have time for this um, great things that you can do here with seesaw and conferencing for a grade um, you can check that out yourself. Maybe I can do that in a future webinar or get better at doing this so fast. Um, here's my information again. Julie, do you have any questions that have come up? We actually do, and we have a few compliments as well. And I love this topic so much, Arthur. Um, it's really thought provoking, and I appreciated all the resources and quotes you include too. Okay, so here's a couple of things coming in for you. Um, Joe sure. is, um, Joe's um, writing in from Australia, and she is asking for a reminder do you have your settings in Seesaw set so that students see each other's work or are you just posting the exemplary work and they don't normally see each other's work? Um, yeah, I do not have it so that they see each other's work. We have a personal narrative at a certain point because they're seniors and they're doing these college essays and they get kind of personal. And so we actually close it down um, after maybe the first week of school. And uh, if there is something exemplary, I will tag everyone. And so I can do that. I crop the picture so that the person's name is not visible because I don't want them to get, you know, razzed for having an awesome paper like they sometimes do. But uh, I just want them to see what, what was great about it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And then LaDonna is writing in and she's telling us what her takeaways were from this webinar. She said she really appreciates the idea of using the folders and she says she's gonna use the assessment and the artifact sheet for her students. So that's a good bit of feedback. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, we, we can take a couple more minutes, so don't hesitate to type in a question. If you have a question or some feedback for Arthur, feel free to type it in. Um, Joe, I can also tell you that I was teaching high school seniors and I also like Arthur did not have them viewing each other's work. So when we were collaborating on things, we were doing doing that in some other digital spaces like a Google Slides or Google Docs where they could work collaboratively, but in Seesaw they were not seeing each other's work. Okay, I have a couple more things coming in. Um, sure. do, you, do you use the Seesaw blog? Do you use the blog and post your exemplars there? Every now and again I did. I did a lot more last year. I found that not many people visited and I always was forgetting to tell them to go there. So I just found that I feel tagging everyone, you know, posting something to the stream, 
to the journal uh, and then tagging everyone seems like it gets more traffic that way personally. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Kathy's also asking about the folders um, and that's kind of a technical seesaw question. I wanna remind everybody that if you're kind of looking for some how to type information from seesaw about folders, I mean, you do the folders by clicking the wrench or some people call it the spanner in the upper right of your seesaw class. And that's where you turn on those settings or enable those settings, but you can go to help dot seesaw dot me and type in the word folders and then all of the resources we have around folders will come up and that will include some PD type videos for you. Um, let me read through and see if we have anything else coming in. Um, Joe is uh, saying that she does like your idea of tagging everyone but the class itself is still like private and students aren't seeing each other's work so she appreciates that yeah. as well. Okay, and cool. Kathy's gonna go to ideas and look at uh, more about folders. Well, Arthur, this was so helpful. We don't have a ton of questions coming in, but I like that um, they know where to reach you if they yes. want to contact you, communicate with you on Twitter. Um, I think that'd be great. And I would be excited to have even more webinars on this topic or even subtopics like the conferencing that we really ran out of time for. I think this was great. And as a high school ELA teacher, you know, this is really, you're speaking my language here. So I loved <laughs> it and learned a lot. And I would love to collaborate more and, and talk with these folks more too. So I want to remind you where you can find us. You can tag us in anything you want to um, say tonight about this webinar at CESA. Arthur's um, Twitter was up on the screen a minute ago. And then of course you can find us too. Yep, at EdTechJulieJ. I love this. I love this topic. I learned a lot and I hope all of our listeners did as well. Thanks so much, Arthur. I hope to be back with you again soon. That sounds great, Julie. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who came. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.